all this and more on The Heresies. August 24th, 410 A.D. For the first time in 800 years, Rome, the Eternal City, is sacked by conquerors. King Alaric, the barbarian Visigoth leader, ransacks the city and takes many of its citizens captive. People spoke of the Eternal Rome. Rome had lasted for centuries, and the founding of Rome was thought to be a divine event, and suddenly, to find that to be false, to find that the empire was not eternal, but temporal and fallible and was able to fall apart. It precipitated a very profound crisis, and not only for the pagan Romans, but for Christians as well. Surviving the siege was Pelagius, a popular Celtic monk with radical ideas on free will. He flees to Carthage, not far from the city of Hippo where the great theologian of grace, St. Augustine, was bishop. The intellectual battle that would ensue between these two men would have theological reverberations within the church for centuries to come. The debate between Pelagius and Augustine, it's one of the great paradigms. It's similar in this respect to Arius and Athanasius, one might say, but one of the reasons it's a paradigm is that it clarifies a basic alternative in how we understand the relationship between God and man. Sometimes Pelagius is portrayed as having a very optimistic understanding of humanity and of human beings, but when you push his system you see that it places an incredible crushing demand on humanity. I think what's at stake in this debate throughout the whole uh, span of the Christian era is salvation. To understand the roots of Pelagianism, we first have to understand who this man was before his flight from Rome. Pelagius was a Celt born in the mid 350s AD in Britain. After living as a monk for a number of years, he moved to Rome in order to preach his doctrine of man's perfectibility through asceticism. First of all, he's a monk. Pelagius is a monk so that he can do good works, so that he can pursue perfection and train and discipline his human will. On top of that, you have the Celtic background of Pelagius, which is a, a, a background that really kind of has an optimism about human nature, an optimism toward creation, so in the sense that Anything God created can't be bad. So there's a real reluctance there to see the human being as depraved. There's a reluctance to talk about original sin, I think at least uh, for Pelagius there is. And so Pelagius comes into it with this great optimism about humanity. Pelagius comes to Rome in the, around the year 380. In Rome itself, Pelagius was known as a very much a tough-minded, no-nonsense, spiritual director, and he especially worked among Rome's elite families who were known to being of some of the last to convert to Christianity. And Pelagius emphasized to them sort of the rigor of the gospel. Pelagius is not an isolated thinker. Indeed, he represents the traditional doctrine of people educated in Greek philosophy, especially Stoicism. In many ways, Pelagius has a kind of older or earlier philosophy or worldview. Uh, in one sense, he, uh, coming from Celtic Christianity, he would reject some of the dualisms of body against spirit. But on the other hand, he would have accepted a very sort of Roman way of thinking about how every human should have the power to make their mind rule over their body. Now this comes from Stoicism, 
but it doesn't just stay in Stoicism. It, it becomes sort of the predominant Roman way of thinking about the human person. And so Pelagius believes that there is no excuse for you not to make your head rule your heart or your reason rule over your emotions. And therefore, there's no excuse for you to let your emotions get the best of us and fall into sin. Stoic philosophy was one of the basic influences in the monastic movements. He had acquired some of this idea that we need to not just understand things properly and receive an understanding through study of scripture and study of the classics, but we also need to work on ourselves. We need to work on our will. We need to bring our own will to a certain kind of perfection in order to be worthy, you might say, of the Christian life. Pelagius becomes a popular teacher in Rome, and his emphasis on free will gains a broad following. Up next, we'll see how St. Augustine responds to the challenge. Stay tuned. Hello, family. In a few short weeks, we'll once again be celebrating the holiest event on the church's calendar, the resurrection of our Lord. At EWTN, we have many programs that point our hearts toward our resurrected Savior, including masses, documentaries, live shows, and children's programs. This work of evangelization is possible because of the grace of God and because of your generous donations. Every day of the year, we hear stories about how God has inspired countless people through EWTN. Some people have decided to become priests or religious, in part because of EWTN. Others tell us that they are now closer to our Lord by watching daily mass and praying along with the Holy Rosary. And many viewers and listeners have told us how EWTN's programs were instrumental in their journey into or back into the Catholic Church. This is why I hope that you'll step forward today and share the gospel message this Easter. With each gift, you're making an eternal impact. Thank you. I pray that the remaining days of Lent are fruitful and that your Easter season is filled with God's blessings. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please make a gift today by going to EWTN.com slash Easter gift. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Next time on EWTN Live, join Jim Bertrand and Father Mitch Pacwa for a special presentation as they explore the mysteries of the Shroud of Turin on the next EWTN Live. After the sack of Rome in 410 AD, Pelagius, the austere Celt from Britain, takes his radical ideas on free will to Carthage and then to Palestine. It's here that he's met head on by the great champion of grace, St. Augustine. Pelagius finds himself in Rome and then fleeing to North Africa. And in the process, Pelagius runs across the writings of Augustine, and especially Augustine's very famous autobiography, The Confessions where Augustine lays it all out there and explains what happened to him to make him so pessimistic about human nature and about the possibility of human goodness. And this infuriated Pelagius because he thought it let people off the hook. St. Augustine was one of the key figures in the development of Christianity, especially in the Western half of the empire. In his youth, he was drawn to Manichaeanism a dualistic religion which described reality as consisting in a struggle between a good, spiritual world of light and an evil, material world of darkness. In his conversion to Christianity, Augustine rejected his older, dualistic worldview and yet retained a strong sense of the dark, sinful side of human nature, and thus the necessity of God's grace for salvation. Augustine is the one who kind of separates the idea of 
spiritual growth and maturity from a stoic kind of strictness. You remember in, in Romans where Paul says, I know what I should do, and then I do this other thing. I do the very thing I don't want to do. St. Augustine was like, yes, Paul, you and I are soul brothers in that. One way to understand Augustine's response to the Pelagian teaching or doctrine would be with his emphasis overall on original sin. More or less the idea that all of us, in some sense, have the effects of original sin because of our human condition. And because of that, we need a grace, that we need help, in some sense, to overcome our more or less addiction that we have to sin itself. Pelagius becomes disturbed by what he finds in Augustine's writings, and there's actually one anecdote that we know where there was a bishop that was quoting Augustine's confessions to Pelagius, and the quotation was, give what you command, command what you will. And Pelagius was so enraged with this particular teaching that he went and struck the other bishop because it went so much against his understanding of the will. If you think about the monastic life is a devotion to try to become perfect in one's existence and to do that one conforms one's whole existence according to a monastic rule which involves radical and quite rigorous experiences of fasting and practices of mortification. And so that would seem to imply that we are in a way perfecting our own will. And so it's not difficult to see that Pelagius would say, well, you know, if we can't perfect our own will, then what would be the point of these practices? If it's all grace, it would seem that we would have nothing to do. Pelagius accuses Augustine of having an overly pessimistic view of human nature and rejects his notion of original sin. Augustine, on the other hand, rejects Pelagius's anthropological optimism because it marginalizes the necessity of Christ for salvation. Augustine's response to Pelagius was to immediately accuse him of heresy. There are problems in what Pelagius was saying, and Augustine saw the implications of those problems. So, for example, Pelagius downplays original sin to the point where he questions the need for infant baptism. Later, he'd be accused of saying that people don't need baptism at all, but the point is, is that that because Pelagius had this great optimism about human nature, he really believed that everyone was born with a clean slate and it wasn't until you sinned your own sins that you needed baptism. The question there was the nature of human freedom and Pelagius thought that you only have freedom if you take initiative on your own, if it's something that you do consciously and deliberately yourself first. And so anything that's given to you prior to that is going to be a denial of your freedom. For Augustine, in perfect contrast, freedom is liberated by God's initiative towards us. And so, in fact, our free participation in the church is possible only because we've already been taken up into it. Because it's been given to us, we're able to choose it freely. And so infant baptism then would be a very natural thing to affirm for Augustine. For St. Augustine, God's grace and man's freedom are not in competition with one another. Indeed, human freedom itself is not possible without the free offering of grace infused by God within the soul. For Pelagius, on the other hand, grace is something exterior to man. It's more like information. It's the Gospels. It's the example of Jesus. But the primary thing for him remains the human will. Maybe one short way just to summarize the difference between Pelagius and Augustine on the understanding of grace would be that for Pelagius, grace is merely something like a vitamin, a supplement, something that one takes from time to time to assist one on the journey, where for Augustine, grace is air, that we don't exist as Christians without that necessary help from God. What ends up happening is Pelagius reduces grace to something passive so that for him, the will is all active. Well, for Augustine, it's kind of the opposite. For Augustine, the will is passive because it's broken and it's grace that's active. And the church would eventually conclude that Augustine was more right 
but it was really about this synergy, this cooperation between the power of grace and the human will. The Council of Carthage at 418, we see an assembly of hundreds of African bishops that come together to adjudicate this issue of the understanding of grace and free will. And they propose nine anathemas uh, against Pelagius. And one of the things that they emphasize that was particularly interesting is that they say that even the saints say, forgive us our trespasses in the Lord's Prayer, which connotes that all of us have a particular struggle against sin, and that in some ways, all of us need the mercy of God. And this would be in contradistinction to the Pelagians at the time who were in many ways arguing that one could live a sinless life based on the autonomy of one's will. After Pelagius is condemned as a heretic at the Council of Carthage, he's expelled from Jerusalem and ends his life somewhere in Egypt. But the controversy is far from over. Up next, we'll see how the conflict between Augustine and Pelagius continues to arise in the church again and again, including today. Stay tuned. Rediscover a path back to the Lord this Lent. Churches around the world are opening their doors for the faithful to encounter the great mercy of Jesus Christ in the sacrament of confession and Eucharistic adoration. Join the church in prayer as EWTN takes you to the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception to celebrate the opening mass of 24 hours for the Lord. Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. For me, it was a 15-year struggling match. It was a surprising thing to realize that there was a continuity between Scripture, what the early church taught, what the Catholic Church still taught. It's so real and so natural that we would, we don't, we're not perfect, and yet we're called to be perfect. And so each day I can try to be a little bit more perfect by God's help. Witness the Holy Spirit at work in a new episode of Catholics Come Home, tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. In the centuries after Pelagius, the church adopts what becomes known as the semi-Augustinian position. The idea that while we are saved entirely by grace, free will is the ability to either accept or to reject this grace. In other words, yes, we are saved by grace through faith, but the dignity that God gives to his creatures is the free will to either cooperate or to reject this free gift. Through the centuries, the church has remained firm in this teaching. The debate between Augustine and Pelagius has re-emerged again and again. The question never really goes away because during the Middle Ages, the medieval scholastics are still debating this and Anselm of Canterbury kind of leans a little bit more towards Augustine. You could argue that Aquinas leans toward Augustine too, but he is a little better at finding that middle way. But then we also will have Luis de Molina kind of leaning in the other direction, perhaps. In the Protestant world, you have Jacob Arminius trying to find that middle way and saying something very close to Molina. You have a debate going on between Erasmus, who is more of a humanist, and Martin Luther. We know that many of the reformers drew from a lot of Augustinian writings. Of course, Martin Luther himself was an Augustinian monk. And sometimes Augustine himself is blamed for parts of the Reformation. But something that's good to remember, especially, is that Augustine wasn't so much a systematic theologian. He was more of a controversialist, a debater. So especially in the midst of the battle with Pelagius, he overemphasized sometimes some doctrines in order to comport himself within the debate. And unfortunately, sometimes the reformers then picked out various different strong Augustinian statements to buttress their own theology. The church has always gravitated toward that place of balance and avoided the extremes. And so if a spirituality tells you, hey, it's all on you, you can do it, there's something wrong with that. But if on the other extreme, if a spirituality tells you you're so broken that you might as well just throw up your hands and stop trying, well, there's something wrong with that too. During the Protestant Reformation, 
A number of the reformers adopt an interpretation of St. Augustine which emphasizes the darkness and depravity of human nature to such an extent that free will almost entirely disappears. In someone like John Calvin, for instance, it's God alone who initiates and carries through the work of salvation to such an extent that the human soul is eternally predestined for heaven or hell, regardless of one's love, faith, or merit. Modernity, with its enlightenment philosophy of optimism, progressivism, and emphasis on self-determination, falls squarely on the Pelagian side of the argument. Pope Francis has noted that modern Pelagianism is characterized by programs of self-fulfillment and a failure to acknowledge the necessity of God's grace. Pelagianism is another one of these heresies that have really entered into the very fiber of our thinking. This idea that we need to work for our salvation. For the Christian, it's precisely what you've been given is what's best about you, not what you've made for yourself. So this idolizing of the self-made man, so that's a cultural expression of Pelagianism and therefore a heresy. So we do see various different forms of Pelagianism that reemerge today. And perhaps one way to understand that is, as we know, Pelagius very much emphasized self-determination. He emphasized the fact that one has complete control over one's will. And we see maybe echoes of that in our contemporary culture, especially with people who want to define, in some ways, moral system for themselves, who want to define maybe even their own gender, define their own fate. Where in contrast to that, the church's tradition would say that we have to receive who we really are, and that would be sons and daughters of God. And within that light, we're able to come to our truest understanding of ourselves. This is a particular temptation for Americans because our self-reliance and our sense of freedom has permitted us to do things that were never thought possible before in human history. And so we can have that temptation. We can live that lie that our self-reliance, as Emerson said, uh, can pave the way to our prosperity, pave the way to our success, can manifest our destiny and make us totally exceptional in that regard. But to buy wholesale into that is to really miss out on the uniqueness of the gospel and also the truth about who we are as human beings who need a savior before we end up saving ourselves. I think it's fair to say that Pelagianism anticipated some issues that we have in the church today. I think in some ways you could blame Pelagius for the prosperity gospel and for this idea that uh, if you just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, physically and spiritually, God will reward you for that. And uh, in sort of making a, a very earthly system of rewards built around the Christian life, and I think that's uh, problematic as well. All of these expressions of what, to use a fancy Greek term, you might call autosoteriology, basically self-salvation, all of these expressions of this idea that I can figure out what my problem is and then I can come up with a plan of life, you know, maybe through a life coach and work out a practical plan of how to overcome this problem that I'm suffering. That's perfect, pure Pelagianism. But it's also, I think, a fairly common cultural phenomenon, and it gives you a sense of how pervasive this spirit is. And if it is true that this spirit is heretical, it gives you a sense of how far we have drifted from the church and from the classical Christian tradition that the church represents and embodies and brings forward. If the world is indeed smitten with this new emergence of Pelagianism, what is the proper response of orthodoxy today? When Cardinal Ratzinger was elected as Benedict XVI, he had a press conference, and in the conference, some of the reporters asked him, if you were stranded on a desert island, what books would you like to have with you? And the Pope said and responded, the Bible and Augustine's Confessions. Ratzinger basically come out and said that, you know, some of the moral failings of the last century in the church is due to a crisis of self-reliance. We're not relying on the grace of Christ. We're not relying on the sacraments and their ability to affect changes on the level of our nature. Instead, we go on mimicking 
uh, what we think is going to uh, get us by, and ultimately that's not salutary. I think we need to reclaim that emphasis on the sacraments as a work of God's grace, something God has done and God is doing in our lives through the power of grace. The theological dimension, first of all, is to become educated in our faith and to understand what the church teaches about the Trinity, about Christ, about our life in Christ and so forth. So for example, returning to the center of our family life and our community life, a sense of festivity and celebration. One of the best expressions of that is community celebrations. Of course, at the heart of all of this is the liturgy of the church that breaks the backbone of Pelagianism right at its source. This recognition that what is best about the world is what we've been given and to learn in a habitual way to say thanks for it. The incarnation of Jesus Christ has never ceased to scandalize. And through the centuries, heretics have attempted to make the faith more acceptable to human reason. The heresy of Pelagianism offered the world a Christianity without grace, a philosophy of mere self-improvement. It's the mission of the church, as it has always been, to faithfully proclaim the gospel and pass on to the next generation the faith that comes to us from the apostles. Thanks for joining us on The Heresies. Hi, I'm Doug Keck, inviting you to join me next time when our guest author is Deacon Richard Eason, his new book, Spiritual Excellence, The Path to Happiness, Holiness, and Heaven. When the hard times come, and they're going to come, mm -hmm. the challenges in your family, in your job, if you're communicating with Jesus on a daily basis, then he helps give you the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of how to understand the problems and the challenges you have, and then how to get through them. Next time on Book One. EWTN's Cathedrals Across America and the Diocese of Gaylord, Michigan invite you to a celebration of apostolic succession as they welcome their new apostle and shepherd, Reverend Jeffrey J. Walsh. From St. Mary's Cathedral, the Mass of Ordination and Installation of Reverend Jeffrey J. Walsh as the 6th Bishop of Gaylord. Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN. EWT, live truth, live Catholic. Cari fratelli e sorelle, buona domenica. Dear brothers and sisters, happy Sunday. Siamo al cuore del cammino quaresimale. Il Vangelo della We are at the heart of our Lenten journey. And today, the Gospel begins by presenting Jesus, who comments on some news of his day. 
While people still remember the 18 people who died when a tower collapsed on them, they tell him about some Galileans whom Pilate had killed. And there is a question that seems to accompany these tragic events. Who is to blame for these terrible events? That perhaps those people were guiltier than others and God punished them? These are questions that also come up today. When bad news weighs on us and we feel powerless before evil, we often ask ourselves, is it perhaps a punishment from God? Did he bring about a war or send us a pandemic to punish us for our sins? And why does the Lord not intervene? We must be careful. When evil oppresses us, we risk losing our clarity. And in order to find an easy answer to what we are unable to explain, we end up putting the blame on God. How often we attribute to him the, our own woes or you know, misfortunes in the world. To him instead, who instead leaves us always free and, and never intervenes imposing but only proposing. He who never uses violence and instead suffers for us and with us. Indeed, Jesus refuses and contests strongly the idea of blaming God for our evils. Those persons who were killed and those who died when the tower collapsed on them were not any more at fault than others. And they were not victims of a ruthless and vindictive God which does not exist. Evil can never come from God because he does not deal with us according to our sins but according to his mercy. This is the style of God. He can't deal with us in any other way. He always treats us with mercy. Instead of blaming God, Jesus says we need to look inside ourselves. It is sin that produces death. Our selfishness can tear apart relationships. Our wrong and violent choices can unleash evil. At this point, the Lord offers the true solution. What is it? Conversion. He says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It is an urgent call, especially during this time of Lent. Let us welcome it with an open heart. Let us turn from evil. Let us renounce the sin that seduces us. Let us be open to the logic of the gospel. Because where love and fraternity reign, evil has no more power. But Jesus knows that conversion is not easy that so many times we make the same mistakes and the same sins that we can become discouraged and sometimes our commitment to do good can seem useless in a world where evil seems to rule. So after his appeal he encourages us with a parable that tells of the patience God has toward us. The patience God has toward us. He offers the consoling image of a fig tree that does not bear fruit according during the accorded season, but it is not cut down. He gives it more time. Another possibility. I like to think about a, a nice name for God would be a, a God of a God of another possibility. There's always another possibility, another chance, always. That is G His mercy. This is how the Lord, Lord works with us.
He does not cut us out of his love. He does not lose heart or tire of giving us tenderness and his trust again. Brothers and sisters, God believes in us. He trusts us and accompanies us with patience, the patience of God. He does not get discouraged, but always instills hope in us. God is Father and looks after you as a father. As the best of fathers, he does not look at the achievements you have not yet received, reached, but the fruits that you can yet bear. He does not keep track of your sort shortcomings, but encourages your potential. He does not dwell on your past, but confidently bets on your future because God is always near to us. The style of God is, we should never forget it, is always closeness. He is close, like mercy and tenderness. That is how God accompanies us, God of mercy and tenderness. So let us ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to fill us with hope and courage and kindle in us the desire for conversion. Ave Maria, grazia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus et benedicto fruttus ventis tu Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre, Amen. Fece ancilla Domini. Fiat mi secundum verbum tu. Ave Maria, grazia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus et benedicto fruttus ventis tu Iesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre, Amen. E verbo un caro factum est. Et abitavit in nobis. Ave Maria, grazia plena, Dominus Tecum, benedicta tui mulieribus, et benedicto fruttus ventis tui, Iesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre, Amen. Ora pro novi, Santa Dei Genitrix. Ut digni e ficiamur promissioni bus Christi. Grazie a tu, an questumus Domine, mentibus nostri si infunde, che angelo nunziante, Christi fili tu, incarnazione coniovimus, per passione meius ed crucem, a resurrezione in gloria perducamur. Per Cristo un Dominum nostrum. Amen. Gloria a Patri, et Figlio, et Spiritu e Santo. Sicuterati in principio, et nunca et sempre, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Gloria a Patria, et Figlio, et Spiritu e Sancto. Sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Gloria a Patria, et Figlio, et Spiritu e Sancto. Sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Profidelibus defuntis, requim eterna andona eis Domine. Et lux perpetua luce a teis. Requechant in pace. Amen. Sit nomen Domine benedictum. Aiutorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Qui fecit celum et terram. Benedicat vos, Omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Cari fratelli e sorelle, non si arresta purtroppo la violenta aggressione contro l'Ucraina, un massacro insensato, dove ogni giorno si ripetono scempi e atrocità. Non c'è giustificazione per questo. Supplico tutti gli attori della comunità internazionale che si impegnino davvero nel far cessare questa guerra the war, the war aggression against Ukraine has not ceased and continues violent acts of aggression occur each day Anche there is no justification for this I appeal to the world to put an end to this civili, there are bombs in, on civilians and bambini, on elderly and people and pregnant mothers I went to visit the young children who are uh, here in Rome who have been wounded in the war. 
young, innocent children. One uh, had an amputated arm, one with a wound to the head. I think about the mil millions of Ukrainian refugees who have to leave everything behind. And those who have do not even have the possibility to leave. Many grandparents and grandchildren who can were separated from their families. So many who are dying under the bombs and those who are unable to find refuge even under um, bunkers. All of this is dishuman and sacrilegious because it goes against the, sacri the, sacri the sacredness of human life. Above all, it is against the human life, innocent human life, who, which should be respected and, sh and not harmed, and should come before any strategy. It is a cruelty, one that is sacrilegious and dishuman, inhuman. Let us pray for a second for those who are suffering. pray with Pope Francis for those who are suffering in Ukraine. It consoles me to know that the people who have stayed under the bombing, there is no lack to the solidarity and the closeness of their pastors who are experiencing and showing their fraternity and, and closeness. And I spoke to several of them recently, and they are close to, the, to their people. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your help to, and concrete assistance to your offering to many desperate people. I also think about the Apostolic Nuncio, who was just made Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Viswaldus Kubokas, who since the beginning of the war has remained at Kiev with his collaborators and who brings my closeness to the, mar the suffering Ukrainian people. Let us be close to this people, the suffering battered people. Let us embrace them with our prayer and concrete assistance. And please, n let us never become used to violence and war. Let us not tire. Let us not tire of welcoming generously as we are even in not only in the emergency moment as now but in the weeks to come those who are playing we know that in the right in this moment we all put give everything we have to welcome people who are playing but then as time goes on we gradually forget these women children who with time uh, without work and left uh, separated from their husbands will be sought out by the vultures of society. Let us protect them, please. I invite every community of ev and every faithful person to join me on March, on Friday, March 25th to in consecrate Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary so that she, the Mother of Peace, will obtain peace for the world. I greet all of you, Romans and pilgrims who have come from Italy and various countries, especially the faithful of Madrid.
I'm the international group of Agora Peoples of the Earth. And the doctors and medics of the uh, 118 Association. The ren charismatic renewal, Catholic, Catholic ren renewal, the Catholic charismatic renewal movement, which is the only one that is recognized, officially recognized, not other ones. Also, the little choir of Antoniano of Bologna, of Bologna. Il coro and the choir of San Vincenzo Grossi and the children of the various catechism classes and the pilgrimage from the Diocese of Asti and the faithful from Venice and Sassari. To all of you, I wish you a happy Sunday, and please do not forget to play. pray for me. Have a good lunch, and goodbye. And with that, Pope Francis wraps up his Angelus address and prayer here in St. Peter's Square. We thank you all for joining us. And we hear the bells of St. Peter's. We close this live broadcast of the Noonday Angelus. Please visit our Vatican News web portal, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube accounts for coverage of today's Angelus and other Vatican and world news. On behalf of Vatican Media, I'm Devin Watkins, and I thank all of the technicians who made this broadcast possible, and to all of you for joining us. A blessed Sunday to you all. Praise be Jesus Christ. Laudetur Jesus Christus. Then Peter came up and asked him, Lord, when my brother wrongs me, how often must I forgive him? Your answer to Peter, Lord, 70 times seven times, means that our forgiveness, like yours, must be without limits. Help me today to forgive from my heart all who have hurt me in any way. say that someone who is impervious to the divine touch has a heart of iron or a heart of stone. On the contrary, a loving heart, malleable and tractable, is a melted and liquefied heart. My heart, says David, is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Mary, you are the son of justice. In you, we experience the delights of the ineffable love of his heart for us. O oh, beloved mother of the beloved, I beseech you by the heart of your loving Jesus, who is the king of all hearts,